Uh, hi everyone, it's Christine here and thank you so much for watching this video. I am ever so sorry that we didn't manage to go live this evening. I was so excited about being live. I had so many people who wanted to watch but you'll just have to watch it a little bit later this evening and hopefully by the time you're watching this um, you yeah it might be a bit later this evening. So I want to welcome you to the lovely Zoe Lloyd Potter and she's going to talk to us this evening about hormones, uh, and especially related to the perimenopause and to the menopause. And um, I'm at this age where I am looking at, uh, well, I mean, I haven't had the sort of symptoms yet, but I've got a lot of friends who are going through a lot of difficult things at the moment. So I'm thinking, I'm so glad that you are here this evening because um, <laughs> I'm hoping that I might be a little bit prepared for everything that's to come. Because it's one of these things that not so many, I mean, it's talked about a little bit more these days, isn't it? But it, it really is. It really is. In fact, apparently this month is World Menopause Month. Well, there you go. What what fitting? Well, how apropos of, of our discussion. <laughs> yeah. And also Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And of course, hormones kind of play into all of those, yeah. all of those, both of those factors. So um yeah. So Zoe, just for, for very quickly, if you can introduce yourself to people, that would be great. Just to you know, tell tell them a little bit about you know why and how you got into hormones and what made you particularly <laughs> interested in them. That would be great because. Uh, well, I guess um, I spent most of my life as a as a legal analyst, not as a as a hormone nutritionist. Um, but I guess necessity is the mother of invention, and I was that girl at twenty two with. Uh, no periods for two years and uh, going to the doctor and going, well, I really don't know what's wrong with you. And, um, you know, two or three years later after that, I had a sort of diagnosis of what is a common condition now, polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, but still the doctor said to me, if you press Google, you'll probably know more about the hormone condition than I do. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> being very honest, you know, because um, they didn't know very much back then. And the great thing now is we have so much more information um, about our hormones, how we test them effectively, um, how we can, how genetics play into it. So we can test our genetics and we can test on our, our nutritional status. So many things now that we've got to hand that you know, will a give a proper diagnosis and help actually, you know, remedy the condition with diet, lifestyle, and sometimes you know, supplemental hormones where necessary. Uh, so that's that's the great thing I think now is we've moved on on a lot uh, in our knowledge. So, um, as a you know, menopause. I mean, hormones at any age. We're going to talk a little bit more of an emphasis today on perimenopause and menopause, but really, you know, hormones can go out of whack, as I call it, at any age. You know, it can be puberty, it can be postpartum, um, it can be, you know, because you have more conditions like endometriosis, PCOS, more PMS, PMDD, which is a much more sort of serious side of PMS. Uh, as well as perimenopause and menopause. And really, all of the sort of factors that we're going to talk about tonight play into all of those conditions. So it's kind of relevant to, to anything, you know, uh, imbalance of hormones can, can happen at any time. And as we know, hormones are so powerful, aren't they? I mean, I know exactly, yeah. like I get to a point in the month when I know that I need to just stay at home, run myself a nice bath, and I might be a bit down, and I might feel a bit tearful, and I know that that's just my hormones. Yeah, <laughs> and exactly. then two days later, I'm fine. Exactly. And, you know, I think I think even the most hormonally relatively balanced person has a little bit more challenge if they're still cycling as a woman in that sort of luteal phase. So in that last 14 days heading up to your period that is a more challenging time for most people you know like you say you have to have a little bit more self-care you have to pay attention to your sleep because you get more fatigued you have more cravings you need more carbohydrates you know um 
that's a kind of normal sort of you know um sign of of just you know that fluctuation of, of estrogen and progesterone in that second half of the cycle so and yeah. what do you think zoe because one thing about about me personally is that i have only ever taken the pill and i don't recommend this to anyone because obviously you know i can't <laughs> but i've only ever taken the pill for one year in my entire life mm, me too and, and so yeah so i know my my cycle really well and i know, yes. you know when it's i know when the hormones are at play but yes. what about sort of women that are on the contraceptive pill or have the marina call you know i mean how mm. is that going to affect someone like that with all those kinds of I think the problem is I mean there's obviously two reasons people take the contraceptive pill the one is obviously for contraceptive purposes Mm -hmm. sometimes you know a a girl at puberty who's having really heavy menstrual periods and they're moody and depressed and you know you name it and the doctor whacks them on the pill Mm -hmm. as a sort of mitigation of that instead of kind of treating the hormone imbalance it's like let's whack you on a synthetic hormone. Um, And what we know about that is, although ostensibly it may sort of flatten out a little bit your mood or, you know, severe symptoms, it doesn't treat the underlying hormone imbalance. And that's the danger really, because that imbalance is still going on. You're just kind of not aware of it. It's a bit like taking an aspirin when you've got a headache. The, the, the pain is still there the inflammation is still there you've just mitigated you feeling it <laughs> so um yeah i mean it, you know synthetic horm- hormone uh, you know synthetic uh contraceptive pills um have their own problems because you know they're they're not bioidentical our body doesn't recognize them um you know the, it's, a, it's it's a, it's a, it's a synthetic progesterone a progestin mm-hmm um and you know they they can the, the the problem is when you take any exogenous hormone it actually dysregulates your own endogenous supply yeah so quite often then a, a a female will be only on the pill for a year or two years but if they're very sensitive to that mm. they come off the pill expecting oh i'm going to start a family now and they realize oh my goodness it's completely wrecked my fertility um, and in some women that can take two, three, four, five years to get back to producing your own hormones in a natural way. Mm. Um, and obviously, people, you know, some women are more sensitive to taking a, a contraception than others. Um, so, but anyway, but that's contraception. But yes, yeah, I mean, <laughs> well, sorry. <laughs> but the but same I- goes for taking HRT at the other end. You know, yes. um, a lot of the HRT the old HRT was synthetic. It was a synthetic estrogen. Um, it was a synthetic progestin, not progesterone. Um, the estrogen was quite often made from an equine urine, a horse's urine. So although it was natural, it wasn't bioidentical. So, um, and, this, and the same go, thing goes, it doesn't, the body doesn't recognize it. It, re- it doesn't recognize it as, a, it just recognizes it as a chemical. Yeah. Um, and that's why, you know, synthetic HRT has had a bad rap, rightfully so, because it has caused a lot of problems for women with hormonal cancers and uh, other problems, so. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I feel like there's just going to be so much to talk about. So if we can't <laughs> fit it all into this half an hour, we're no, just... No, no. I think we should, we should maybe use, uh, maybe have HRT and uh, all of the sort of estrogens and the progesterone as maybe a separate video where we have it, you know, maybe some people can ask some questions about that, some of your viewers, and we can do a little session on HRT. In- no, that would be great. But anyway... Actually, <laughs> perimenopause and whether it's we're going to talk today about more about hormone imbalance and whether that supplemental hormone is actually necessary and hopefully it isn't but you know people can make the decision for themselves so instead of kind of going straight to the doctor and going stick me on hrt <laughs> <laughs> what can we do then what can we do to prepare our bodies to prepare ourselves for this time because yeah. it's 
but it can go on for a long time, can't it? Yeah, so let, let's let's quickly just define um, perimenopause and menopause. So menopause is when the period has, you've had a cessation of your menstrual cycle for a year and your LH level, which is your luteinizing hormone and your FSH level, which is your follicular stimulating hormone, which happens at ovulation, are high. So if you're 40 years old and you've had a cessation of periods, but your, your, um, your levels of LH and FSH are normal, you are not in menopause. You've got something else that's stopping the period. So it, it's actually both of those things. Um, and yes, so you, you then have a decline in estrogen, you have a decline in testosterone and you have a decline in estrogen. And of course, they can have, you know, very dramatic effects on, on the body. And although menopause is described as natural, which it is, <laughs> it can also be for some people incredibly physically and psychologically challenging. Mm. Partly because, you know, uh, women can suffer from hot flashes, night sweats, which disturb sleep. So of course, sleep disturbance and makes you feel terrible all day. You can have um, low libido, you can have anxiety, more depression, um, you can have, you know, more weight gain, um, drier skin and, and a sort of crashing fatigue as well, which a lot of women experience is sudden horrendous fatigue. Um, and, and all of this is, is a, a sort of imbalance of hormone. Mm. So, so what happens with uh, menopause is that the estrogen that was made by the ovaries and the progesterone gets taken up by the adrenal gland. So the adrenals sit on the top of the kidneys. Um, estrogen is also stored in the fat cell. So um, you know, we get a little bit from the fat cell, but mainly from the adrenal gland. Now, the adrenal gland, as we know, <laughs> is responsible for our cortisol and our stress hormone. So because cortisol is essential to life, I mean, if we have no cortisol, we die within five days. Mm. You know, it's a serious medical emergency. So the body if you are stressed and you've had chronic stress for a long, long period of time, will prioritize the production of cortisol because it, it needs to keep you alive. <laughs> so it will downregulate then if your poor little adrenal glands are trying to do all of this, your, uh, mainly your progesterone, but also your, your estrogen and your testosterone too. It's like, look, I need to keep you alive. I don't really care whether you're having me you know, whether your, your sex hormones are in balance. Mm. Uh, so the body's very efficient, you know, it's like, so going into menopause, the better our adrenal health, the better the outcome of probably our menopause is going to be. Awesome. Now, I remember my big mentor, uh, Pamela Smith, who's written lots of books on hormones, she's been practicing for like 35 years and she said that 35 years ago when she had clients coming in testing their cortisol only about five to ten percent was disturbed imbalanced mm -hmm. and now it's like 90 percent wow so that shows what has happened with our you know our do you think that's lifestyle our, yes, our lifestyle and you know cortisol naturally follows a kind of pattern so it's vital you know we we get a, a cortisol awakening in the morning because that keeps us motivated wants to get out of bed <laughs> and if you see cortisol on a curve it rises in the morning and then the idea is it sort of drops off in the evening so that when then we get melatonin rising in the evening which is our sleepy hormone so we get this lovely rise of cortisol, keeps us awake, and then we get this lovely rise of melatonin where we're supposed to go to sleep. Mm. Of course, today, you know, we live under artificial light. Um, we're awake till with our iPads till, <laughs> exactly, and I'm guilty of that, till one, two in the morning. So, um, and then we're kind of, we don't wake properly, we're tired in the morning, our cortisol doesn't function properly. Um, so what you have, and then we can be chronically stressed. Mm. 
Mm. So instead of seeing this lovely cortisol rise that dips off towards the evening, you'll see somebody whose cortisol is raised all the time. Yeah. And when that happens, the, that's, that's very, very abnormal for the body. And because cortisol in the short term is really good, it's an anti-inflammatory hormone, it's brilliant for you because it's our fight flight response. But if we're in constant fight flight, the body will downregulate it. It'll go, right, okay, I've had enough. You're damaging your body. I'm going to downregulate it. So then you get people who have what we call a flattened cortisol. They have no spike in the morning. It's just flatlined on a curve. And these are the people that can't get out of bed in the morning. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it's called adrenal fatigue. You know, you've heard get that, that gets uh, banded about a lot. Oh, I've got adrenal fatigue. Um, but that's what it is. Mm. So then if you look at, so you think, okay, well, what's cortisol then got to do with progesterone and our, our other hormones? So if we have chronically raised and dysregulated cortisol, then that will affect the thyroid. So that's the next link in the chain, if you like. It's like this whole interactive kind of sort of web. <laughs> Spider's <laughs> web. <laughs> Where you pull on, you know, you pull that little spider's one little tentacle and the whole web collapses, you know. Yeah, so one thing is out, it just affects everything. Everything, else. everything. Um, so yeah, your melatonin being out, you can't then sleep. Um, so that then, you know, you have your thyroid. And your thyroid, of course, is responsible for your metabolism and for your growth and development. Um, and, you know, you see people who have dysregulated thyroid, they are either very, very hyperactive if it's hyper, or they, again, can't get out of bed. If they have low thyroid, they're tired, they're fatigued, they have weight gain, they're sluggish, they feel cold all the time, they have dry skin. Mm. And, and thyroid has become an epidemic. Has it? I, I mean, of my four best friends, three of them take thyroxine. Wow. It, it's actually, I think I read one of the the biggest prescribed drugs it is almost epidemic and also underdiagnosed mm. very underdiagnosed Interesting. and so thyroid um is obviously produced and then converted in the liver to the active form and we need t3 we need really good t3 to produce estrogen so <laughs> If the cortisol is not working, the thyroid is not working, the estrogen is also going to be dysfunctional. So it kind of that cascade. And we know that we get cortisol, high cortisol, and we get a, what we call a progesterone steal, although that's technically not right. It's called the progesterone steal because it's more like if your, if your cortisol is abnormal, it will, your receptor sites will look at the cortisol rather than the progesterone. So your progesterone doesn't work efficiently. So then you've got a real imbalance. Mm. So, and you, you hear the word banded about a lot, estrogen dominance. I don't know whether you've heard that word, Christine, where what that really means is, um, and it happens a lot in, it can happen at any age, but it happens a lot in perimenopause where, so in puberty, you tend to have quite a nice sort of, um, fairly stable amount of estrogen and progesterone when you go into perimenopause you tend to have estrogen that's doing this on a graph so if you take 28 days of somebody's estrogen estradiol it, it goes up and down up and down up and down and that's why we can be so symptomatic we can feel great one day crap the next day fine the next and be like why it's like being schizophrenic <laughs> It's like, why am I feeling great one day and I'm feeling like I need to cry the next, you know? <laughs> this can be a very frustrating time, the perimenopause. And, and this can last five to 10 years before, oh my goodness. before technical menopause. Mm. So this can be very, very challenging. And, you know, the estrogen going up and down is one thing, but the progesterone dropping can be another because, of course, progesterone is really good for, for making us feel good and not having anxiety and depression and all of these things can really play in when we lose our progesterone. Mm. So you get a lot of women then who 
think, oh, I'll just dab a bit of progesterone. I'll go get some bioidentical progesterone cream, which you can get. And it's organic and it sounds really great. And I can slap a bit of progesterone on. Um, and again, you have to be really cautious doing things like that, you know, because um, it's fine while you're still producing estrogen, um, maybe to have a little bit of progesterone, but it always needs to, the estrogen progesterone always needs to be in balance. That's the key. It doesn't matter whether you're in perimenopause or menopause, there is still a balance between those hormones. And if you're in menopause and you're literally having no estrogen, and you're slapping on progesterone cream thinking it's good for my anxiety, yeah. <laughs> then that's causing high progesterone, low estrogen, and that can lead to things like insulin resistance and diabetes. So you have to be very careful because everything affects everything else. Very delicate balance, isn't it? It's a very delicate balance. And this is why you can have one woman who has the same symptoms as another and the temptation in there is the one woman goes, oh, it's because I've got low progesterone. And the other woman goes, oh, well, I'm getting, you know, those symptoms. So mine must be due to low progesterone too. Mm. And making that assumption, which can be very wrong, you mm. know? So if you take, for example, hot flashes, because that seems to be a common menopause symptom, um, you know, men uh, hot flashes can be due to low estrogen or fluctuating estrogen but it can also be due to high cholesterol, uh, cortisol. Mm. So you can get, you can be completely not in perimenopause and have a hot flash and it's to do the cortisol and not to do the estrogen. So I always say to people, if you have any symptoms whatsoever, always go to your GP, mm. get thoroughly tested for your sex hormones, for your insulin, for your, you know, whether you're going into insulin resistance or pre-diabetes and um and cortisol yeah. get them all tested because you can't guess what yeah. Yeah, and it's really important. really important not to self-diagnose and start oh you know I'll, I'll try a bit of this or i'll try an adaptogenic herb or i'll take more vitamin d or you yeah. know all of those things can be good but you've got to know what you're treating it's very very important so, so when you get those results um, mm -hmm. and, and you know exactly what's going on, what mm -hmm. can you then do, you know, to, to balance these hormones? I mean, yeah. not for someone like yeah. you to in. <laughs> uh, yeah. what can you do? Well, I'm, can I share it, see if I can share a screen with you now? Yes, let me see if I can uh, remember how to do it now. Um, no, it doesn't matter. I can go through all of the, the bits that we need to maybe take into consideration um, yeah i will work this out oh god i'm not having a good day today <laughs> we're not having a good tech day today no. oh yes no here we go zoe uh, well, we need to keep our cortisol low remember christine <laughs> we don't want it affecting our other hormones keeping our cortisol low <laughs> so we're making you the host so you can share your screen yes fabulous thank you <laughs> oh dear the cortisol, that's also, isn't that the hormone that makes us all sort of a bit podgy around the middle as well, as far as I remember. Yes, it, it contributes to um, this sort of belly. This is what pe women hate. It's like, oh my God, I, it's not necessarily always that you're gaining weight, right. but your, um, your distribution of fat changes. So it kind of goes off your bum and your thighs and ends up, around your middle so you lose your hourglass shape which is can be very frustrating and that is um it, it it's it's kind of partly cortisol partly losing your estrogen progesterone mm. because they all kind of modulate weight gain or loss as it were so yeah we could talk about weight gain as a separate oh yeah sorry <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you okay. see my screen, Christine. Can you... I can see your screen, yes. Okay. So when we're looking at what we can actually do to balance our hormones, then all of these things on this little wheel here all influence it. Um, 
so we've talked about controlling our stress so i'll go there and go and work we've, been, we've talked about improving our sleep wake cycle mm -hmm. so we need to be in bed by 10 11 o'clock at night we need to have had dark light we need to be not looking at our um blue light you know we need to we need to not be looking at our pc and everything else because that disrupts our melatonin um just out of interest sorry i don't know if you know this but you know you can get those little glasses that fill yes yeah up. yeah I, I haven't got any but i think mm. that that i do try to be in the dark at night i mean i know i do sometimes have my facebook or instagram or something like that but you know i'm i'm trying to get better at that i really am um Maybe because i realize how vital that is the, if there's one thing that you fix first it's stress and sleep they are the most important things because mm -hmm. quite often the dysregulation just comes from that yeah okay yeah. it could be something really simple as that I'm really like really as simple as that because um that kicks in our circadian rhythm and if that is all out of balance then nothing works properly even our insulin doesn't work so, properly. so do you think also i mean actually now i'm actually really going right back to teenagers you know <laughs> would that affect teenagers as well then you know when they're in their sort of not sleeping and go to bed late and then <laughs> well you know the thing is with teenagers they can get away with it a little bit more you know because they have a natural you know their growth hormones high and their um cortisol is not as disrupted because they haven't had years and years of stress <laughs> um so you know that's why they can get away with it a little bit better than, than we can but, but so self-care when you're getting into the perimenopause you know has to go has to go up a notch yeah. let's face it you know yeah so improving our sleep wake cycle so you know we need that morning light into the full spectrum light and it can be really challenging in the winter i know but um you can buy full spectrum light boxes so if you're challenged with this then um that can really help because that you know straight it's full spectrum light straight into the retina in the morning that makes the hormones work well so this is this is really important, you know. So if you can go out for a morning walk um, early in the morning before you start work, mm -hmm. that massively regulates our body. And then try and go to sleep as we did ancestrally, you know, um, not under artificial light. Go to bed when it gets dark yeah. um, as much as we can. What at five o'clock in the afternoon? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> We're not going to do that, but you know what I mean? If you can sort of start winding down by 8.30, 9 o'clock and then in bed for 10.30 and then sleep and then wake at six and get yourself out into daylight, mm. you know, instead of, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm a real night owl and I can be, I'm one of these people, I, I can be there till two in the morning and I, that's my, that's my sparkle time. It's really? so annoying. <laughs> it must be annoying. <laughs> It's so annoying. My sparkle time. My husband's sparkle time is at five five a.m. and I'm oh, no. <laughs> the opposite ends of the day. So improving our sleep wake cycle is super important. Improving our insulin sensitivity massively important. So we didn't talk about insulin, and this is another hormone. Um, now, so insulin affects the amount of glucose we have running around in our bloodstream, and um, we're only supposed to have about a teaspoon of glucose in our blood at any one time. So the insulin is responsible for getting that glucose that we've, when we've had a sandwich and a packet of crisps and a soda, you know, getting the, the insulin rises to get that glucose into the cell because it's very dangerous when it's swimming around in the bloodstream. But obviously the more kind of dysregulated our diet is, the more uh, either, you know, refined carbohydrates we're eating all the time, which spikes our insulin, or just eating all the time, grazing all the time. You know, we have people whose insulin never comes down. You know, insulin is supposed to go up and come down, up to put the glucose into the cell, back down again. And, you know, I'm, I'm so guilty of that. But I, <laughs> yeah. And of course, everybody used to say, oh, you need six meals, little meals a day. And I'm like, no, you don't, because your insulin is never going to go down. But I, ha I have a whole 
fruit, you see. I, I, I have like, I like to buy lots of fruit and I eat sometimes like 10 pieces of fruit a day, which is terrible, isn't it? I mean, if, you know, you think it's healthy, but it's probably... Not. Well, it's healthy, yeah, but you know, you can have kind of too much of a good thing, you know? <laughs> and like you say, maybe if you ate it in one go instead of kind of like all the time, because then you have this, you know, it, it is kind of weird insulin because you think a lot of people think, oh, well, I'm on a vegan diet and I'm super healthy. But when you actually look at people's insulin curves who are mm. eating sugar, even in the form of fructose in fruit all day, mm. then their insulin never comes down. And um, that's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to have periods of not eating and then periods of eating, you know. So improving our insulin sensitivity. And a lot of people think, well, I'm not diabetic, so I'm fine. No, not necessarily. So um you know the two are actually different so you can be you can have high insulin and still you know be relatively you know you're, you're not necessarily pre-diabetic so so the, the big thing is to um not eat too often and not eat too much loaded carbohydrate mm -hmm. all the time you know refined carbohydrates really mm -hmm. and then uh improving our liver health and well, why do we need to improve our le liver health um a because it is the main organ that responsible for converting our thyroid. So if our liver health is bad, we don't convert our thyroid well, and we discussed how bad that is on the knock-on effect on sex hormones. Mm -hmm. And also our liver is um, responsible for our estrogen detoxification. Mm -hmm. So this is where a lot of women run into trouble with hormone problems, breast cancer, Mm -hmm. uh, is that they don't clear their estrogen so estrogen is produced and then it goes through stage one stage two, and stage three detoxification stage one and stage two taking place in the liver so again if your liver is compromised because you're eating again you know you're you're I don't know, you've got you you've got a lot of medications that you're taking and you drink, drink a glass of wine every night, maybe or two. Well, you know, this is this is the thing with alcohol. I mean, I was seeing a podcast the other day by a, a cardiologist and mm. and he said, you know, there's absolutely no doubt about the evidence that a small amount of alcohol improves cardiovascular risk, mm. but it increases breast cancer risk. Mm. So you have to weigh up as a person where your risk is um you know if you've got a family history of breast cancers then you don't want to be heavily drinking through the perimenopause because mm -hmm. that's going to add to your risk so um you know we all know you know we all have an odd glass of wine and that's fine but uh, you know it's something to keep to know about and because if your body is is your liver is processing a lot of alcohol it can't process too a lot of estrogen no so um so it's, it's, it's a bad one, isn't it? Drinking. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So improving our liver health is is really important, mm -hmm. and then reducing our environmental toxins. So um, we we know that estrogen. So we have three estrogens, and we'll discuss that maybe in another because that's complicated. We have three different estrogens now, and people think, oh, we I didn't realise that. I thought we only had one estrogen. <laughs> um, so we have three estrogens, but we also have what we call xenoestrogens and these are the estrogens that are very damaging to the body because they are like fake estrogens um, produced from pesticides you know house cleaners you know all of the topical stuff that we slap on our body um, these bind to our estrogen receptors and make the estrogen that we have our own good estrogen dysfunctional because it's like hang on a minute I've got this toxin that's attached to the receptor and what, what do I do and you know it's hard to get these toxins off the receptor sites so this causes a lot of estrogen dysfunction too can um, you explain that a little because I know I mean but maybe for some people they don't know what a receptor site is so can you yes so, <laughs> yeah, so, so all of our cells have have receptor sites for a myriad of things so that so that when a hormone or a, a vitamin or anything goes out into the body, that it uh, latches on to the cell receptor site. So it's like a little of, docking like stick. A little lock, like a docking stick, exactly. So, <laughs> exactly, that's a very, very good analogy. Um, 
if you get these xenoestrogens or whatever they're called yeah xenoestrogens they, they go into the docking stations and then go into the docking stations but unlike our own estrogen that we goes onto the docking station and then we metabolize it out these xenoestrogens lock onto our estrogen receptors but like the estrogen receptors like yeah but it's docked on but what is it this is a chemical this isn't what i'm used to um and this it's very scary. It's very scary, isn't it? It's very scary what uh, environmental toxins can do mm -hmm. uh, to disrupt the hormone balance. And, um, you know, you've just got to do your best with this, you know, try and eat as cleanly as possible, try and grow some of your own food so you know it's organic. Um, you know, it's not possible, I know, from a cost perspective for everybody eat, to eat or even find organic food, but you know, do, you can only do what you can do. Um, try and mitigate, you know, using harsh household cleaners, be really conscious of that. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we can't all walk around with a Michael Jackson bubble and think, oh, no. I'm, <laughs> I'm immune from environmental toxin because it, it is what it is, but you know, it's important to be aware of it and just not be neurotic, but try and mitigate it as much as you can yeah yeah and then and then boosting on nutrition density because um that is so important people um nutritionally spend a lot of time looking at macronutrients they concentrate on your how much protein you've got and how much carbohydrate you're eating and how much fat you're consuming and am i ketogenic or am i you know all of this dietary stuff that's going on at the moment and don't pay attention to the micronutrients which are you know all of the minerals that we need all of the b vitamins that we need to for the body to function well um, and if you even if you look at the thyroid gland that takes optimization of about 14 nutrients for the thyroid to work efficiently so if you're lacking in any one of them and even energy production as well i suppose you know energy production just producing the energy to live <laughs> yes <laughs> yes yeah, yeah exactly Exactly. But, you know, that's what the, the energy production is more in the sense of protein, carbohydrate, fat, what you're, that's the sort of macronutrients, what you're using to fuel the body in terms what of, I, what, sorry, what I mean is like, when we get down to the actual production of adenosine triphosphate, is, if I remember, yeah, the energy. Yeah, yeah, adenosine, yeah, yeah, adenosine triphosphate, it's very good, <laughs> ATP, <laughs> ATP, yeah. Yeah. yeah that drives the cell yeah it, it drives our energy um so yes absolutely but we need micro micronutrients to drive atp drive the mitochondria which is the energy production of the cells as, as well and the glands definitely require you know all of the micronutrients mm -hmm. you know the thyroid in particular requires iodine so does the breast tissue and um you know iodine is something that you know, if you're not eating a lot of seafood, um, shellfish or fish, and um, you're having sea salt, because, you know, there's not a lot of iodine in sea salt, um, mm. unfortunately, and iodine was taken out of bread. At one time, it was added to bread, and now it's taken out, and it was replaced by bromide. So we have lots and lots of people who are iodine deficient, mm. and that is the main reason their thyroid's not working. Um, and I'm not suggesting everybody goes and glugs back a load of iodine. I'm just saying that it's it's something to be aware of. And, you know, but the doctor never goes, oh, you've got an iodine problem. You've got a thyroid problem. Let's test your iodine level. They never no, do. I guess it's like that whole thing about soil erosion and they're not. Yeah, soil quality, micronutrients in our actual food that we eat. And it just, I mean, my mm. goodness, this topic is just so huge, isn't it? It's, so, it's do you think it's important when we're going through perimenopause and menopause? Do you think it's important that we take some supplements? Do you think that's what we need to do as a preparation? I think it's like you say, in an ideal world, if our soil had the correct, you know, we talk about the gut microbiome today and lots of attention paid to that. Um, but the soil has a microbiome and that's what's been lost with modern agriculture. And because of that, we have very low nutrient density in the soil. We therefore have much lower nutrient density in the food that we eat. And therefore, 
we are not feeding our body how it used to be fed. I mean, I, saw, I think I saw, saw a statistic whereby you have to eat a whole box of strawberries today to get the same nutrient content that used to be in one. Gosh. So you think about it, you can't eat that much food. Mm. So, you know, in an ideal world, it'd be like, oh no, just get it all from food, you know, but the reality is, is different. And um, most people don't realize that, so you can go. No, no, I, absolutely. It's, you know, um, and also it isn't, you like say, you know, it isn't just what you eat, it's what you absorb. Exactly. And, you know, if you've had a diet that's very high, you know, some people are much more gluten sensitive than others. And, you know, some people have like cereal for breakfast, sandwich for lunch, pasta for dinner. It's a huge amount of gluten. And although you may not be gluten, you may not be celiac, that's a lot of, um, that's a lot of a substance that strips out the minerals from your body. Yeah. So depending on what you eat, you know, it, you need to be able to absorb your uh, minerals and, and vitamins that you eat efficiently. And to do that, you have to have a good microbiome. Um, so, you know, lots of attention paid today to having some fermented food, some raw food, some cooked food that kind of, um, and some probiotics maybe, that uh, fuel the microbiome so that everything we eat we're utilizing well yeah yeah so that's why uh you know new, boosting nutrient density uh, but boosting ab ab absorption uh, that's, i think on there i've got improving the digestion and the microbiome yeah very yeah very yeah Oh my goodness there's just so many things to talk about <laughs> so, all of this all of this and our sleep and our, and our exercise. So if you look at exercise, you know, we don't want to be exercising too much because that raises cortisol, particularly in the perimenopause. Oh, you know, great, great. <laughs> I'm doing you know, I have lots of women that come to me and they're like, I've gained all this weight and I'm, I'm running a marathon and I don't understand it. I'm utilizing all of these calories and I'm putting weight on now. What is going on? And I'm like, because yeah. your body now needs a little more nourishment you need a uh, more efficient exercise rather than more prolonged exercise so mm. a bit more h you know a bit more high intensity a bit more resistance training but not necessarily running for an hour at a time um which is raising your cortisol and, and contributing to the to the belly fat you know the weight gain around the middle so uh, exercise we need to be doing um we need movement as well as exercise because um, you know, uh, movement is very, very important. I see lots of people that go to the gym and they think they're brilliant. And then they sit on the couch or behind a screen for the rest of the day and don't actually move. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, so you think the half hour at the gym is compensating for the fact you're actually doing nothing for the rest of the 20, 23 point, you know, 23 hours a day or whatever. So uh, movement is really important. So I say like when you're even at the kettle, you know, when you wait for the kettle to boil, do some sit, you know, do some lunges, or if you if you've literally got an hour in front of the telly, then do some side kicks, or mm. you know, move your body because that mm. burns calories. Um, much more efficiently keeps the, the the metabolic rate high, much more than just going to the gym for half an hour. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I walk my dog. That's what I do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Walking. You know, our ancestors, the women, if you look at women and, you know, so the men went off hunter gathering, but the women would walk miles sometimes they, to just get water or, you know, or be in the fields. So they weren't necessarily running a marathon, but they were moving constantly. And, you know, it's, it's, it's just the way of the world now that we sit because our jobs are so computer focused and this is so unnatural for us, yeah. really you know um and it doesn't help our hormones no, no. <laughs> or our metabolism <laughs> yeah so and obviously as we get older we need to make sure that we're not losing our muscle mass because we you know we start to get what's called sarcopenia mm. which is the loss of muscle from about the age of 40 and when our muscle starts to deteriorate uh we our you know our metabolism goes down so then for we're much more prone to weight gain um, just from the loss of muscle. So again, we need to be uh, 
really targeted with our exercise to make sure that we're not losing a we're eating enough protein to build the muscle so things like weight training do you think is that what we exactly thought? a little bit of resistance training and um yeah really important because we need to be building the bone so when we lose estrogen really important as everybody knows that we're more prone to osteoporosis because we lose bone mass mm. bone density um so it's really important if we're not going to replace that estrogen that we really work hard at um you know maintaining that through resistance training mm. yeah yeah. Wow. So yeah, there's so many things that we need to to consider, really. Yeah. Oh so you asked me about supplementation, and I would say, if you, if you're looking at a pyramid in order of what's correct, so stress and sleep, correct that first. Nutrition, correct that next. Fitness and exercise, hormone optimization, in whichever way you know you will talk about HRT or you know whether that's necessary or not but mm -hmm. nevertheless you know trying to increase your natural progesterone natural estrogen and then I think supplementation is the last resort because you have to be really careful how you supplement yeah. but you know I think this is really great so I really appreciate you um you telling us all of this because what I think is so wonderful about it is that when you learn about things and especially, you know, I think I've, I mean, I've learned so much this evening is that it gives you kind of a choice, doesn't it? That you can actually be a bit more proactive in your health. And I think it's. So yes, cool. yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, you know, everybody's menopause, perimenopause is, is different. We have a unique, it's our hormones are as unique as our our fingerprints so you know um we know that like by 70 years old 20 percent of women are still producing estrogen wow so you know some people's estrogen natural estrogen production goes on longer mm. and so those women may be less symptomatic we also know that as we when we lose our estrogen from the ovaries production then it's stored in the fat cells so women who have I don't mean to be overweight because that's not good. We know that. But um, being underweight may give us a worse menopause too because, oh. you know, the body will pull the estrogen when it's required from mm. the fat cell. So, um, yeah, so sometimes being underweight can be bad going in, in, into menopause as well. I mean, I have met, I have one friend. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I have <laughs> we have a friend. <laughs> friend who told me that she when she went through the menopause she didn't have any symptoms at all yeah and I've always thought you know that's what I want to be like <laughs> no I was going to make a joke at the beginning and I was going to go you know when we're young we envy things like you know girls who are skinny or yeah. girls or you know girls who had great fashion sense or girls who were just too too cool for school and now and our, we envy women who go oh I went through the menopause I didn't even know I've been through it no, yeah. no, I didn't get any symptoms at all. And we're like, really? <laughs> well, that's the only person I've <laughs> who said that. So, um, you know, I'm... Menopause I'm envy. Others. <laughs> and maybe I'll be one of them. I don't know. Well, hopefully if, uh, if we do all these things, then uh, maybe... Yeah. Yeah. The thing is, like you say, just balance your hormones as much as you can. Balance your cortisol. Yeah. You know, yeah. take some adaptogenic herbs. Do more meditation. Do, you know... Um, have some acupuncture mm. you know all of these things help the cortisol and that helps them out you know we, so we sleep better and that helps the thyroid mm. and then you know be eat well so our thyroid works well and then you know our sex hormones will, will even in menopause work better yeah and also very quickly before we go because i think we've been here for quite a while now uh one thing we talked about actually before we jumped on was um also the attitude isn't it the perception of yeah. it yes so, yes I think that's so important as well and obviously something that i'm quite passionate about perception you know i think life is all about how we perceive it really um and you know that that can play a, a big factor in menopause as well i, I think you mentioned well, yeah, is that exactly? It's just, again a similar thing where you could have, um, you know, two women with, you know, you do all their blood work and you look at everything, their genetics and you know their nutritional status and and they're the same. Uh, and one woman could be suffering hugely 
you know, mentally or with mental, you know, anxiety, depression or physical symptoms. And the other woman's just sailing through like no problem at all. So that is something that we cannot test for. And that is perception of menopause. And it's not right or wrong. Some women will suffer more feeling that it's the loss of their youth and their fertility that will play into their mind a little bit more than let's say another woman who feels incredibly liberated by the fact that oh god I've no longer got this dreaded bleed every month and, <laughs> and up and down you know you know symptoms and and I haven't got to think about contraception and anything like that and it's you know, for a woman, that's like, oh, I've had my kids and I'm done with all that and I'm free now, you know. And then, so the perception is something that you cannot test for. No. And it will result. And, that, you know, other women, it's like, oh, my God, I'm so worried. I'm getting all these wrinkles. My estrogen's gone. And look at these wrinkles I'm getting now. And, you know, and they, they mourn yeah. the loss of their fertility. So if we can focus on all the positives, then maybe yeah. it will also be a little bit easier. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I guess on that note, Zoe, I have, you know, because you've had the slide there, I kind of have lost complete track of time. <laughs> uh, but I think we've been talking for half an hour. I know that. <laughs> but I just wanted to thank you so much for coming on this evening. And I'm just so sorry that we couldn't do it live. <laughs> but it's been great fun. And I know that everyone who's going to watch it, they're going to learn so much, just as I have. And I felt like I've been well, that's good. Here that's good. To sit here and be it hasn't been all doom and gloom because I, I think it's, it, it, I think it just shows that we can take everything. We know what factors contribute. Yeah. We can take that into our own hands. And yes, we may have to do more self care. There's mm. no question about that. As we get older, in general, we have to do more self care. Mm. And what we could get away with at twenty, we can't necessarily get away with at forty. Mm. So, but knowing knowing all the factors, we can be proactive. So, and then feel yeah. more in control. You know, when you yeah. know stuff, you have the choices, and you know what to do. Yeah, yeah. It's all out of your control. Yeah. So, um, so thank you so much for coming on. And you know, if you have any questions at all for Zoe, please put them in the comments below or contact her. Zoe's going to put. Uh, I don't know if you've got a page or a website or anything you want to yes. put below. I uh, have video. That would be great. So if you do want to chat to Zoe about anything, if you're, you know, have got issues with your hormones, get in touch with Zoe because she clearly knows what she's talking about. So it's been so interesting. And uh, if also if you know if you would like to explore any more subjects a little bit deeper that we talked about, I'd love to have Zoe back um, if there's some interest actually because uh, I think it's just fascinating. Uh, and yeah. there's so many more things we could uh, delve yeah, into. We, did, we didn't really cover HRT today and that's a subject I think a lot of women have a lot of concern yeah. about yeah. how to, if you need to do it, how to do it safely. Mm. That's a big well, Do you know what? Maybe we could have that as a sort of, uh, I know, it's, is it is it is it this month or next month that it's uh, menopause month? I think it's this month. <laughs> I think okay. it's this month, yeah. yeah. Well, world menopause. I didn't know it was actually. <laughs> I saw a gynecologist post on LinkedIn today going, it's world menopause month. And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, maybe we could do it in November because I haven't got any more spaces for October, but maybe in November we could do yeah. it. If you're up for it. Yeah, works. I'd love to talk about HRT, menopause, whether it's necessary and what's, how to do it safely. Yeah. yeah, so if you're interested in Zoe coming back and talking about HRT and how to safely take it, put your comments uh, below and then we'll arrange that for November so anyway we better get going now and and I'll let you get on with the rest of your evening so you can get uh, get to bed early without being on the also screen so that my sleep wake <laughs> up is not yeah. disrupted okay. so lovely talking to you Zoe and uh, you know, I don't think I'll be able to finish this because um, you are still the host I think so um, yeah I've stopped sharing my screen stopped sharing your screen and yeah. um, then we can say goodbye so goodbye everyone thank you for joining us this evening and we'll see you all very soon so i hope you enjoy this replay and um, i now have to make myself the host uh, i still don't know that i know i just um, technology is reclaim host there we go i am now the host and we can end the meeting all right <laughs> good night zoe bye take bye. care bye bye. everyone bye bye <laughs>